John, uh, Jonathan Fruitkin, and what we have now is a panel of kind of the, the uh, preeminent uh, lawyers in this space, and Blaine. And what we are what we are hopeful to accomplish is a couple things. The first is really as an opportunity to answer any questions that everybody has that have been kind of percolating in their in their head, for a couple reasons. One reason is because it lets the rest of us test each other, which we only get to do once every six months or so, conferences like this. And second of all, it hopefully allows us to get a sense of what sort of things are actually affecting you. Because ultimately, you know, this group of attorneys is very active for whatever, for better or worse, with interfacing with, with policy leaders so that we can make this better and better. So with that being said, do we have any kind of questions that have been percolating? All right, that's good, because this is supposed to be an hour of questions and answers. Oh my so God. I will start. Um, so, Question. oh good, so, <laughs> please. Um, on, on Andy's uh, discussion of expanding Red Dead to SEC filers, how, how would you read really, uh, the uh, that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just, for the yeah. audience at home, please yeah. stand up and speak louder so we pick it up on a microphone. Yeah. Thank you. What was your question? <laughs> let, me, let me repeat the question, make sure I got it right. Yeah. Okay. For SEC filers, is there a chance that we're going to expand existing Regulation A to, 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 to do that? And Sam, why don't you to give that a yeah. shot? Um, the reason I want to answer the question is not because I can answer it, but I actually, my name is on that letter. I work with OTC in putting it together and getting it filed with the SEC. So I, I'm, I'm intricately familiar with, with the, all the issues. Um, I think that if it's going to get done, uh, it's certainly basically what the petition is, is to allow any company, and I, I think that's smaller, smaller reporting companies, to use regulation A. Now, why isn't that the case today? Well, under the Jobs Act, the SEC had the authority to allow it, um, but they chose in the initial rules not to allow it, and of course, it's good for business, it's good for small business, capital formation, it's good for OTC markets business. If you can broaden the base of companies that can, that can use Reg A, particularly to smaller public companies. Um, and there's some technical reasons, I don't want to bore you the details. Um, the, the, the problem I see is this. One is, I'm not sure how much of a priority it is right now at the commission. Um, they love Reg A, but in terms of, do they want to expand it? There's, I can't think of any reason not to. On the other hand, they're just very tentative about things, and it's easy for them to say, well, let's see how it works out, and you know, they have 10,000 other considerations. So um, on the other hand, that could change, because we now have a, a Republican in the White House. We're going to have a new SEC chair that's going to be appointed by the president. Uh, we're going to have a three to two majority in favor of the Republicans in, 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 in the SEC, where now we don't. So, Things could happen now that were not possible um, because, I mean, generally speaking, rulemaking petitions are not acted upon. But with a new commission and a new party in charge, uh, it, it's, it's anything is possible. Um, so, with that kind of, I guess, question, it, it begs kind of a bigger picture question. And what I, I think I'd like for Sam to do is maybe the quick, like, three minutes. Let's back up two days, okay? Let's talk about what was going on, and then we can put the pressure on Brian and, and everybody else, and Jonathan and Blaine, to say what they think is going to change with the trajectory we were on. But Sam, I'm gonna let you do this because you're you're oh. in the trench. I mean, we're all there, but you're in the trenches no, no, that's a lot. Fine. So, yeah, I, I need a little bit of focus. I mean, we've yeah. got what I see as a spectrum of internet finance. We've got five hundred six C, which is your general solicitation of accredited investors. We've got Title III, which is up to a million in a very heavily regulated structure, and then we have Reg A+. Plus. Um, I, I don't know what the views are. I mean, just looking at Reg A+, Plus, which is why we're mainly all here, um, I don't really see you know, anything you know, glaring in the existing Reg A+, Plus ecosystem. Now, there may be smaller things here and there, but I haven't heard anyone clamoring for a fix. Now, of course, expanding it to reporting companies, 
the legislation is already there. But that's not to say that maybe Cromwell gets excited enough at the beginning of the year after the inauguration to go up to Capitol Hill and and get somebody to write up and pass a bill to require the FCC to do that. But other than that, in terms of dollar amounts, um, the FCC has the authority to raise it to 100 million. And again, they want to see how it works before they do that. And I don't think the problem with the use of Reg A Plus is you can only raise $50 million in a 12-month period. So I don't think there's no pressure there. So, so, um, so maybe I'm asking a broader question. You know, we've yeah. had these structural problems, Reg CF and all this other stuff. And we said, all right, we're going to we're gonna be supportive of some efforts to fix that. We have right. what we call the fixed right. crowdfunding act. And, and, and everything there was, was kind of moving along, right? And two right. days ago, we could have had a discussion about these kind of little changes that we could hope for, but now it's different. So I'm gonna to turn to Jonathan Wilson. Jonathan, what do you think is different now <laughs> than was two days ago in light <laughs> of the elections? Yeah, um, that that you see what 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 could happen kind of in, in this area in the next couple of years. I'm going to answer your question, but before I do that, I'm going to drop back and okay. provide a slightly bigger overview. And, and and that is before the Jobs Act, you basically had two types of securities transactions. You had registered transactions and you had exempted transactions. And for 80 years, the f the public policy was. Uh, we, the government, don't want you, the securities issuers, to be out there selling securities to the public unless you are registered, which means that you have submitted uh, a Form S-1, all kinds of documents, to the SEC, and, it, and we government guys have reviewed it to make sure it's safe for you unwashed masses in the public. Now, if you're wealthy enough, if you're an accredited investor, we'll let you engage in your filthy little exempt private transactions, uh, but whatever you do, don't say anything about it in the public. And those were the two very separate buckets, and the two buckets never uh, came together. With the Jobs Act, Congress in a, in a, in a rare moment of bipartisan unity said, you know, some public disclosures aren't so bad. We're going to create a few. And we did Reg CF, and we did 506C, and uh, let's also kind of snake the, 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 the line right here between public and private. Let's have this Reg A expanded so that we can have that. Well, now we have a weird mixture of both public <laughs> offerings, completely private offerings, quasi-public offerings in the middle. And one of the challenges of expanding Reg A to 34 Act companies is that we have today a fairly complicated analysis if you're a 34 Act company as to whether or not you're eligible for a follow-on offering of Form S3. And I, I, I've been in public companies that right. were not S3 eligible. Right, exactly. So you, you could actually create the anomaly of a 34 Act company that's, that's eligible to use Regulation A in some expanded format, but not be eligible to use Form S3. And how weird would that be? Right. I wonder if we weren't you know, the five of us, the new SEC, beginning in January. <laughs> what if we completely threw out this public versus private dichotomy and just replaced it with a uniform standard of accuracy and completeness in information flow to the public? Now, that's not going to happen. No, that's not going to happen. <laughs> and the reason it's not going to happen is because the SEC, in terms of Disclosure reform generally always talks about scale disclosure, so it's not going to be one size fits all. But but so, but the you I didn't want to get too technical, but you 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 focused on the gap. There are what I refer to smaller fully reporting companies that have a market cap of 175 million that can't when they want to go out and sell securities can't use what's called an S3, which is a short form. It incorporates by reference the fines already made. Um, and that's the group that I had in mind that I wanted to target, me personally, not OTC markets, for, to expand Reg A plus, because that made a lot of sense. It's either you're not going to get it reviewed if you're a fully reporting company, or if you get reviewed, it's going to be very light, because you're already filing your K's and Q's and, you, and your C's and you know what you're doing. So I, I think that's the sweet spot for the rulemaking petition. Uh, the powers that be at OTC markets wanted to broaden it a little bit, and you know, the client makes the rule. So it's, it's broader than that, but really an area where there's a, a practical need and it would be a practical use uh, would, would be that. And, and, you know, there's some technical things that we, I mean, there are some other advantages, but nobody's ever going to use them as a public company, for example. Okay, a NASDAQ company, let's say, or they, they can use it for testing the waters, but 
I mean, you don't go out and test the waters when your stock is trading on NASDAQ or OTC. I mean, that's the best way to do your deal. So, I mean, and I so you're not going to use it. I wrote a letter of support as well. Yeah. I, I agree. Um, my, my point was that if yeah. we were starting from a blank slate, if we were the kings of America, right. I don't know that we would begin with a public versus private distinction for securities offerings. It might be something completely different, right. but that's not the way the law works. And regardless of who the president is in January, you're going to be stuck with this high bound 33 Act, 34 Act approach to securities. And I'm not sure that the election really has that big of a difference. Uh, Brian, do you think points, you know. do you think the election has that big of a difference with what we are going to see I, the next two years? I don't think it does. I think that it may enable legislation that uh, got stuck. But you still have a Senate that has the ability to uh, to freeze things through filibuster and, and, and the Republicans not having 60 senators. So, yeah. you know, Fixed Crowdfunding Act and a lot of the other legislation, I think those will get done. I think the McHenry uh, uh, Madden fix on the lending side, I think the Treasury automated of, uh, of, of, of Treasury transcripts, any bill like that that makes common sense will probably get through. Um, Trump, uh, I, we went through his materials and we went through Hillary Clinton's materials at around the election time and he's really silent on financial regulation other than this concept of let's let's repeal Dodd-Frank and, and and that's a huge uh, imposition we have six years of swap dealer rulemaking investment advisor rulemaking the CFPB was created by Dodd-Frank the FSOC was created by Dodd-Frank Volcker rule uh, bad actor under uh, private placements. That's all Dodd Frank. I don't. I don't think that there's going to be a way. Even if you could technically figure out how to undo Dodd Frank um, in, in, the, in the legislation, I don't think there's going to be a day that we wake up and say, "Okay, Dodd Frank never happened." There might be parts of it that are relaxed or eased out. Um, the people who review Reg A applications at the SEC uh, are generally career staff people. Uh, they're not political appointees and. That aspect of it's not going to change. I think that you have a fairly weak commission right now because you have two vacancies. By rule, it's it's partisan three to two, so it's going to be three to two Republican with a new chair. Uh, I don't think Mary Jo White's going to stay around to be a commissioner and yeah. not the chair. Um, so you're going to have uh, three new faces uh, at the top, and then you're going to have a Corp Fin staff led by Keith Higgins that's going to have a lot of power. And we've seen that already. Most of what they do is uh, they govern by reviews. Uh, so in the closed end fund reviews on the lending side, uh, deeming uh, loans to be securities. We've seen through Citizen VC, they govern by staff legal bulletins, no action letters, FAQs, uh, the new 147, 147A on the interest state crowdfunding rule. All of that is basically a way of, of you know, a self-policing mechanism within the federal and state regulators. So I don't think the election has that big of, a, of an impact here. Perhaps there's a tonal impact at the SEC that, that's palpable and that, okay, Republican president, maybe there'll be less uh, in the way of enforcement. But if you're looking at doing a reggae offering, I don't think your analysis changes today than it was on Monday. Um, I do agree that you're going to see potentially public companies uh, being able to access reggae. There are disconnects in the rules. Um, you have preemption under Title II. You could have a fully preempted uh, transaction under Title II, flip over 50 million, and then have to file an S-1 and no longer be preempted. And I pointed this out to uh, state regulators and said, what are you gonna do on the day when an Ohio investor opens their computer and their screen goes gray and they call the helpline and they say, well, we flipped from Preg A plus, which was fully preempted, now we have to apply for permission to continue the offering because we're trying to raise even more money than we did before. So a lot of that's not logical to the typical investor and the typical user, and I think that uh, those should get smoothed out. But you know, again, I don't know that the election is going to have a direct, immediate impact on your own calculus in terms of how you raise money. Yeah. Let me just make actually one point where I think there could be actually potentially some progress. Sure. I'm, I'm in the right room for this for OTC markets. Sure. You heard Andy Kizik talking about secondary trading for anything that's well anything that's on the OTC uh, QB or QX uh, because the way our laws work our federal laws work if you're not on a national exchange and OTC markets is not a national exchange then you have you're not exempt from the state blue sky on the resale so that affects if you can sell it in that state in the secondary market um, whether you can have research etc 
And, and one of the things that's it's really a, a really super hot button political issue is to preempt the states from regulating the secondary market. First of all, in the first instance, for Reg A securities, uh, and even broader. And, I, and that's, that is the kind of bill that there's been more than a lot of talk about, but there's ne it's never been politically feasible. Um, so I could see a bill like that all of a sudden getting out there um, and, 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 and getting through. Now, it may not get through right away. It may not get through in the first year. But that's something that would be, I know, near and near to OTC markets, and also not to mention the issuers, because uh, it just, it's just less compliance costs and more liquidity when you're on a stature with the NASDAQ or New York Stock Exchange. So I, I think that's, that's one thing that's practical that people have talked about that realistically could happen uh, without somebody in the White House with a veto power. If uh, California doesn't uh, break off. <laughs> Blaine, you um, you were most recently on the Hill, like the last few weeks, right? You were you were on the Hill. So um, talk to me a little bit about your discussions with the committee staff um, relating to kind of the acceptance of, of of some of the momentum for a fixed crowdfunding act and what you see happening. So as, as some people know, there was a, a pretty extensive fixed crowdfunding act proposed by Congressman Henry. Uh, he actually had another bill which was designed to increase the number of investors allowed in uh, an SPV, an LLC, one might say even at the fund. And uh, I want to focus on that last one a little bit because in, in, in its intent, most of what the Jobs Act was about was enabling capital formation for small and medium-sized enterprises to fill the capital chasm that was created when banks pulled back on small business lending and VCs went above market. That chasm is still there. Uh, there. There are things that are happening in marketplace lending. Brian spends a lot of his time in that, in that space that are helping, uh, but that chasm is, is still there and quite large. And every company that has a chance of being successful has to cross it somehow. The other big part of the JOBS Act was the democratization of investing, not just letting a very small number of rich people invest in these companies where most of the, the returns are, are, are seen as in the small and growth phase, but letting if not everybody, at least a much bigger portion of the population, the U.S. population, participate in that growth uh, because A, it's a place to make money, and B, it's a great way to diversify. So let me focus it in more on the diversification. All the things we're talking about of making it easier or better to invest a targeted amount of money in a single company, great ideas. We've got to continue them. More importantly, should any individual investor ever make that investment? Probably not. Or, or not as a, not by itself, not as a one-off. Um, those small and medium-sized enterprises are, as a one-off, a terrible investment because you're not diversified enough to, to diversify away any company-specific risk. You need a portfolio, I'll, I'll throw out a number, of 100 of them. Um, one might say you know, 10 or 15 is enough in big, large-cap, you know, liquid securities. That's not enough in, in small, tiny-cap, startup-y um, kinds of activities. So let's say it's 100. How easy is it for you to subscribe to 100 separate private offerings? Um, I run a platform, there's a few other platforms here. To combine all the offerings across all of our platforms, we're not even at 100. Uh, so, we, so clearly there, there's an issue there. So I'm going to bring it back to McHenry's bill around how many investors can be in one of these funds. I would argue that um, the 250 that came out of, uh, of the house is not enough because when you say, hey, we need $10 million, or I'll make my math easier on myself, $25 million, and you're only allowed 250 investors, your bite size per investor is huge. If you want bite size of 100 bucks or 1,000 bucks or even 5,000 bucks, we have to find a way, whether it's changing the number of investors that are allowed in a fund, in a private fund, without it becoming a registered investment company, or make the, the transition from not registered investment company to registered investment company much smoother, more gradual, less painful, less expensive, so that individual investors can easily swing by and grab a fund that doesn't have the incredible expense and complexity of a registered investment company as it currently looks at it, and, pick, and in that fund be able to pick up oh, 100 startup tech companies, 100 biotech pharma companies, or whatever sector or combination of sectors they want. That, that's the push. So diversification through small bite sizes of, for lack of a better word, funds, where somebody who knows the space is picking the investments. 
Uh, we had a, a side conversation earlier that's so pointed on this. What's the likelihood that the current regime of investor beware, do your own due diligence, works when you're putting in a small amount of money into hundreds of companies? Not so much. So that's my two cents. So with all that kind of intro, do we have some follow-up questions on what's been said? Yeah, go ahead. Can, can you provide some color? Can you provide some color on the review process as you've experienced it so far in these filings and contrast that with the more traditional? Good, good question. Brian, why don't you fire off? Yeah, so the review process for Reg A is done by the Division of Corporation Finance. Uh, it's the same uh, administrative uh, assistant directorships that review public filings. Uh, I believe there are 12 branches. There are two in financial services. Uh, real estate, natural resources, uh, uh, consumer, and a few others. Um, it really depends on what industry you're in and who your branch reviewers are. Uh, we've had uh, two filings in the real estate division that have gone fairly streamlined. I think there's been a lot of, uh, of uh, experience there among the review staff in doing the e-read products, the Realty Mogul and, and Fundrise e-read equity products and, and they're seeing specialized real estate investment structures start to get normalized. Uh, I think if you're in financial services, uh, it's a tougher hill to climb. And uh, We did a filing, we had 35 comments, uh, came back and um, uh, had five new comments that weren't in the first filing that uh, could have easily been made the first pass. So it, it's, it's a matter of coordination among the reviewers and um, at some point, I was on the phone with the assistant director, and I said, "How are we being treated more, uh, uh, you know, differently? Because this is a Reg A, shorter form capital raise, not uh, a fully blown S one. You're not supposed to have me burn 300 hours on uh, trying to push through a, a smaller offering." And they said, "Well, um, you can actually lose uh, a significant amount of money in a Reg A deal, just like you can in a public deal. So we're not really." treating the review process any differently. There's obviously less in disclosure requirements and after you qualify under Reg A, to only have to do semi-annual books and have a much lighter uh, 8K uh, uh, up for, update form uh, process is, is a lessened uh, burden for you. But the actual review and the scrutiny you get, I think in many ways depends on the branch. It's not necessarily an easier path than doing a public offering. Yeah, would that be consistent, you know, I, Sam, with your experience? No. Um, okay. You know, I think, I mean, I agree with certain things that Brian has said. It, it will depend on, things will vary to some extent in registrations from reviewer to reviewer, um, and also in discrete industry. And I think when you're talking about finance deals, these are not plain vanilla common stock deals, where they. Right, so it depends exactly. On, on exactly. Yeah, because I, I filed one for a mortgage, mortgage company, but it was common stock. Now, if it was more. Brian's more in the exotic financial. See, I call it sophisticated because he's next. And, and, and I'll tell you, if you're going to get CLO these days, what's going on? So, <laughs> if you get into something that doesn't fit within a neat box and it could be totally fine, they're going to look at it a lot more closely. Your area, I mean, that's why you went through a so, bunch so of. The common, you get a lot of scrutiny. The common stuff, you do get less, uh, less scrutiny, but I would not say that it's easy or quick or a. 30-day exercise by any sort. No, no, it's, it's not a, I mean, what my expectation is, and I put this in writing, it's on the internet right after the final rules came out. I said 60 to 90 days if you do it right um, and you don't have any skeletons in your closet. Elio, I think, was 58 days. All right. um, they got a six-page comment letter, uh, which is on, compared to an S1, that's still on the short side. If you look at some of the other comment letters, that's long. I, um, I filed two confidentially. Uh, one was two pages, the other was under two pages, and that includes, you know, the, the boilerplate. Uh, and, and the last one I just filed a few weeks ago, and the examiners, they'll call you after you file it. It gets assigned to the examiner, and they call three days later to introduce themselves, and he says, you're going to get your comment letter on, your, on the 25th, 25 days. And I said, from the date of this call or the date of filing? He said, no from the date of the filing, right, 25 days. And it, there it was right on the 25th day. Um, it, it, so they're putting a high priority on this. And to put it in perspective, let's, let's use another real life example. Uh, a company called Medex, which kind of made the headlines for the wrong reasons, 
Um, they were one of the first to file uh, marijuana-related companies, so already they're in a kind of, you know, okay. Um, they were basically a clone of an OTC king sheet company, all right? And in their disclosures, and the reviewers, they may have different approaches, they read everything. Okay, and in there was a disclosure that was a desist and refrain order from the California Department of Corporations, now business oversight, they call themselves business oversight, that their sister corporation, which is a pink sheets company, um, was, was subject to this, this uh, securities violation for, for selling, gen generally soliciting without an exemption. Right? So you think that that's the kind of stuff that's a red flag to an examiner. They're going to go over the thing real closely. Because so you can sell marijuana okay. legally in California. Okay. Now, so, but so now the security is so, so, so here's, <laughs> here's my question. How long do you think their comment letter was? Their initial comment letter. They had one comment. Right? One comment. They said, could you please put a little more information on your description of use of person? That was it. Okay. Now, what they forgot to do is they didn't do their annual report on April 30th. And uh, the SEC came knocking on the door and suspended their 3B exemption, which is the exemption under Reg A, temporarily, and they have a hearing in December to make it permanent, all right? Um, I wouldn't want to be the reviewer that issued that comment letter with one comment, because I think these guys are in a lot more trouble than just losing their exemption. But, but my point is, here's something with red flags all over it, all right? So, um, and, and, I, and there have been a couple that have actually gotten no review. I've seen a couple that there's no review, and that would be totally unexpected. Yeah. Um, and it stems from the attitude of the staff. They want to see regular <coughs> plus work. What this does, in my view, is puts most, mostly the reverse merger bit, uh, doing reverse mergers out of business. That was the and the SEC loves that because now you can't go public through the back door. You've got to go through the front door. There's a review process. You need audited financial statements. Um, so they like that, and then, so, um, you know, it, it, it is, 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 as far as that goes. So, so the SEC is very friendly to this, um, and so. Maybe, maybe I'll make a comment, then turn it to Jonathan yeah. for, for, to follow up to that. There was some concern by people, and I use the word people to mean me. There was concern <laughs> by me, and other people. There was some concern by people that what we would have is a review process that was worse than the S1 process. I mean, I think Sam was on my, my, my worry, you know, team because they basically um, had the opportunity to, to nip us in the bud there, right? Make it so hard for us to clear the, to qualify in this case, that, that we basically weren't going to use it. And I think that putting aside the number of comments and some other kind of things, I think we've all been pleasantly surprised at the fact that our time for qualification is not you know, hey guys, it's gonna be a six month, one year, I don't know what's gonna happen, old school reggae, go state by state type process. It's really been efficient, for lack of a better word. And I think part of that is the responsiveness to the uh, attorneys who are doing these initial filings for the most part, because right. they're just like, yeah. all right, these guys aren't, you know, the issuers might be a little bit new, but at least we know what we're dealing with and this looks like something we've seen before. With that being said, sure. Jonathan, what's your experience been like? I, I, it, it sounds like there's a fair amount of inconsistency Sure. You, you get you know, marijuana businesses with one comment, others with no comments. Uh, the ones Brian describes with you know, lengthy comments. I think we heard Mark this morning talk about SEC reviewers that wanted to delve into the arcana of whether the entity was a holding company or not. Uh, and things that really were not apropos of what investors but, would care about. But I think there's a re I'll let you go. I don't interrupt you, but I think there's, they have their, their nerve, and that, that's a big nerve. Okay. Yeah. okay. Uh, my, my point was that there's still some inconsistency. Now, I would agree with you. Overall, I think if we're at 60 to 90 days on average, that's not bad. That's not bad. Yeah. Would it be better? Yes. But it's probably not bad for revenue work. Yeah. No, I mean, compared to an S1, you're 30 days for your first comment letter. And my impression of, if, again, for the what I call something that's plain to know, that these reviewers, is my sense, they literally, all they do is they go down their checklist and they check the box. Is this rule, it just, it's, a, it's, it's not the kind of review you get for an S1, where you, you really get some very, you know, sophisticated detail. It's not enough to just have the line items. Right. Very, very different approach. Please do. And, and to what extent, in your experience, are they scrutinizing the marketing materials? I mean, this is a you know, general oh. solicitation. You know, you have this dichotomy between if you want to be working with some 
smaller broker dealer, and then some people are kind of do it yourself, or maybe using you know sophisticated digital marketing combined with do it yourself on the oh no, they're, they're and security side. So, so how much how much are they actually looking at what the consumer or potential securities buyer is seeing and the process of closing? They're, they're looking at it. I mean, they're looking at it closely to see if it's consistent with what's in your uh, offering materials. But if you're using a broker dealer, then FINRA has its own little for advertising, and so it's more plain vanilla. But if you're not, if you're just doing a self underwritten, uh, yeah, they're looking at it, and they're even looking at things out there that people haven't filed for yet, like testing the waters. If, um, if you yeah. if you have a social uh, networking type offering format, then uh, they do want to see wireframes. They want to see screenshots. Uh, what does this screen take you to? Uh, yeah. If somebody's able to leave comments or feedback, they're very interested in that because they don't want uh, one investor to be able to influence the views or, or you know, quote, make an offer to like, another. Like shows. So, yeah, yeah shows. so this sort yeah, of, that's uh, about. Yeah. Uh, I did an offering where there was an open feedback sort of dialogue page and it took a while for them to get comfortable um, because they want to know that you have control over the message and that um, the investor experience is going to be one where uh, it's easy for somebody to uh, to use and that they're not somehow being misled by the process or uh, and, and at every turn you have to be able to hyperlink back to the disclosure docs uh, the 1a or the uh, uh, or the uh, 453 filing and, and, and that sort of thing I would only make the comment on that point, and then I think we have somebody who's pretty tuned into this, and now we'll turn it to Darren. But um, I think that we are still uh, at the beginning of the arc, okay? So we, we haven't seen the enforcement stuff, but I think that for us, that there's a lot of fear that whatever the company does marketing-wise, right, is just a little bit enough inconsistent that it would freak us out. Now. We are all spending a lot of time with issuers and doing that, but it is inevitable that we are going to have some enforcement actions of various types based on the fact that the video was a heck of a lot different than the disclosure. And I'm sure it won't be our clients, I hope, um, but we are going to see that. But we haven't yet, but that's part of because of where we are in time. Darren. So I actually had a question um, for Sam. I'm curious to get the other opinions here. So Sam, you mentioned the deal, um, MedX. That deal came to Start Engine with a Start Engine client, came to Crowdfund X, Crowdfund X client. Um, we saw this deal as highly marketable. It was. It had funded north of a million dollars um, with very little following at the outset. So, from our perspective, it was highly successful. And then, subsequently, and unfortunately, suspended by the SEC because some executive neglected to file a required Form 1K. So my question for you Let is... Let me ask you, do you have any inside information on why they didn't file? No, I Because I'll tell you what the public record shows. No, my shows. question is this. Yeah. I've seen that there are portals and platforms that have been criticized for taking <coughs> crappy deals, uh, for giving bad advice, uh, people who aren't attorneys giving advice to issuers, and who do you think the burden is on to qualify or due diligence these companies? Is it on the securities attorney that's filing the 1A? Is it the marketing company? that's going to package and distribute the deal? Is it on the platform that's going to host it? Is it on the SEC? Who do you think that that burden is on, or is it shared, and how do you think the industry goes forward to prevent deals like that from getting out there and yeah. giving this industry a bad reputation? Well, I think everyone, whether they're, if you're a BD, then you have to do due diligence, and I, I don't think MedEx could have made it through a, a, a platform that had a BD license, right? I don't think a seed invest would have touched it because they had a prior regulatory issue, number one. And number two, it was basically a clone of a pink sheets company, and you kind of had to scratch your head. And they did get some very negative press back in February this year, once they went out. I think Fortune Magazine had a really nasty article, and but accurate. Um, and then there was somebody else in terms of investment class. So it, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't pass muster with a platform, a reggae platform that's a licensed broker dealer. Now, Start Engine, you know, they can sit there and say, well, we're just a technology platform, and yes, and, but at the end of the day, if, if, you know, if these investors sue for their money back, and that's really, you know, where the rubber hits the road, it's not necessarily the SEC. Um, 
you know, they're going to decide in hindsight that, well, maybe we shouldn't have taken this issue or when we read the disclosure that said these guys, well, though not technically bad actors, all right, were, you know, had some issues. Darren, I'd say that most of the deals probably should go through a broker dealer if for no other reason that that's where you're going to want to hold the security. It's the only place where you can trade the security. So then the answer to the question of who's on the hook for due diligence is the broker dealer. And the only issue, uh, two issues with that. One is really small deals can't usually afford to pay for due diligence. Um, even when you get a really efficient firm like a crowd check doing it. The other issue, and I'll try not to you know, suck up the whole time on it, but if we grant that the SEC has been very efficient in their review process for Form 1As for, for Regulation A Tier 2 offerings, which I would grant, um, I'd say my own personal experience and the experience of, of every other issuer and broker dealer that, that's been working on a Reg A offering for the last year is that the FINRA review process has not been efficient. Uh, and, and if for no other reason than without it being really clear to the entire legal and issuer and broker dealer community, the exact same payment maximum compensation grid that's not published anywhere, but that does exist, is being applied to these relatively tiny Reg A offerings as would normally be applied to gigantic IPOs. So saying that maximum total underwriter compensation, which is underwriter basically is a broad definition for anything that a FINRA member does, uh, though there are some exceptions and, and Folio is working through making sure that those are uh, clear and available. For the most part, a 6% cap on a $20 million deal doesn't have enough money in it to pay for the brokers to sell it, to do right. the, the marketing, to do the due diligence, to be the lead underwriter and take all of the liability of the future uh, you know, potential plaintiff's lawsuits. Whereas 6% on a $500 million or $5 billion deal, fine, no problem. In fact, maybe it's massively overcompensated. So um, we don't know the solution. We've had a couple of good conversations with the senior Fender staff to, to raise this concern of the same grid by the percentage basis applied to super tiny offerings. You might say 50 million is not super tiny, but in capital markets, it is. I'll tell you, I'll, I mean, I'll tell you what the solution is. I mean, particularly as it impacts Reg A. I mean, we have, we have broker dealer registration, which the SEC takes really strictly, okay, too strictly, in my opinion. And then you have portals like Start Engine, which are basically technology platforms that can't do any solicitation. I mean, they're just passive. Um, I, I really, I think what we need is, is we need something that I've referred to as broker dealer light that takes legislation. In other words, it's not gonna happen through FINRA, it's gonna happen by legislation, which carves out a safe harbor for, uh, for people to do, like Start Engine, to do more than they're doing. Because Start Engine, for example, let's talk about Start Engine. They're not a broker dealer. They can't charge transaction based compensation because if they do, they need a license. We can't have a customer these account. Are, you can't hold security. So these are, things, these are things that can only be fixed through legislation. And it's something I've <coughs> spent a lot of time thinking about, but it's a major project to get through Congress. But I will tell you. Congressman McHenry last year at an event I was at talked about exactly this for about 15 seconds. I'm sure nobody in the room will just went over their head, but this is what needs to be done, in my opinion, especially in the Reg A plus market. So you can have a start engine. They're not a full BD. They're not under the screws of, of FINRA, okay? So they can get transaction-based compensation. They have enough money in their, in their margins to do due diligence, okay, some due diligence. Um, that's what we need to have happen, and eventually it will happen, but it's a major political fight, and it takes a Republican Congress. There's a BD like could be it, or, or a different, different comp grid for Reg A could be a much simpler solution as well. Yeah. But, but to answer one of the yeah. questions is, uh, Partly. Partly. If, if you miss a filing, I mean, that the, the company is the ultimate, is ultimately responsible. The issuer is always liable. So the company has to take responsibility for hiring the right person, for setting a clock on uh, specific events that trigger update filings, for being on, on, on the ball with respect to the auditors and semi-annual and audit and, and, and annual reviews. Um, I have a reggae company whose fiscal year end is June 30th, and uh, I when they went when they went when they got qualified from the SEC, I sent them a memo that had all their filings. Here's what you have to remember, I'm not always gonna be here, but if any of these things happen, you know, call me or let's let's get this going because you have to send in an update. In addition, you owe a 1K filing 120 days after fiscal year end. That doesn't mean four months. 
So July 31st, August 31st, and September 30th is, um, is uh, 92 days. So 120 days was actually uh, September 28th, which is a Friday. And I called them that week and I said, you know, your, your, your deadline is not Halloween, the end of October, your deadline is, is October 28th, which is Friday. And they said, oh, right, well, I thought we had 120 days. And I said, yeah, but you have to actually count the days, figure out when the deadline is. It's not just four months. They would have said four months if they meant four months. And so, you know, you have to be able to comply with the mechanism and get the easy things right. Um, and, and if you do go off and you can't file a 1K and you get suspended, then you might have liability from investors that are expecting liquidity or might be expecting to do follow-on purchases. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the impact from a liability point of view is, is if Medix gets delisted, and I think they only raised about 800000 so far. Anecdotally, uh, the money is due four months after. You're, you're going to have some unhappy right. investors, and if but they it, find a lawyer that's willing to take on the case, uh, they can find plenty of things yeah. wrong. Count the date. There's a website called timeanddate.com, yeah. and you can actually you put in a date and say, when is it 180 days? Yeah. It'll actually calendar. tell you the there's answer. Yeah. You don't have to go to the calendar. You, it's good to check that yeah. also. But, you know, there's a truism with the SEC. If something's due on a weekend or a holiday, it's due the next business day. This was a filing that happened to fall on a Friday, uh, and, the, and the end of the month was Monday. And so, you know, that, that was a weird situation where everyone assumed it was it was the October 31st, but it wasn't. Yeah. Well, MedEx is, I, I think we're going to hear a lot about them in a bad way, um, because they did have experience with another pink sheet company, which is still trading, it's got a symbol. Um, their report was due on April 30th, their first annual report. Uh, they managed to get their audit signed off by June 30th, that's what's in the public record, but they did nothing until September. Meanwhile, they were selling securities, okay, and so the only disclosure people had was the offering circular, which basically was as of February. So I don't know what the reason was for waiting, but it wasn't that they didn't have money to pay their auditors or even the lawyers because they didn't need the lawyer at that point to get the thing filed. And they filed it four days later after they got the notice of suspension. So I, I, I think when you look behind the curtain, and the SEC certainly is now looking behind the curtain, um, I, I wouldn't be surprised to see to want this to wind up in enforcement in addition to, um, you know, in addition to this, the permanent suspension of pregnant clause. So. So we're going to wrap up yeah. and have a happy hour, but I think um, before we do, because one, it's been, <clears throat> well, it's been, it's <laughs> been eight months since uh, we had a panel kind of about the future, and I made a few jokes at the time. And the problem with the internet is it's out there forever, so I need to do this. Mr. President, I had no idea. I had no idea that you were really going to win, and I apologize for what I said in March. Good luck. <laughs> all right, everybody, have a great rest of the day, and we're all out. We're all out. We're all out. We're all out. We're all out.